Oh, good afternoon. Uh, introduction to philosophy class. Uh, welcome to uh, video lecture number seven. Today we're going to be talking about uh, a refutation of moral relativism, interview seven. Okay, uh, just a little bit of a heads up. When we get to the end of the book, I will talk about the book as a whole. I'll talk about the dialogue, uh, the nature of the characters, and some overall sort of general themes that I think are worth taking uh, time to consider. Um, some of you have already mentioned a few things in your reading reviews about such things, and uh, I had planned, and I do in all my, uh, in, in, in the course, in the regular course, uh, over the regular semester, I wait to the end to talk about some of those general themes. I don't want to uh, sort of skew or bias your reading of the book by bringing them up earlier. Okay, so in interview seven we get the last of Libby's arguments for moral relativism. Remember these are arguments for moral relativism. She's presenting them and then Isa is responding to them. Once again I'll insert some of my own ideas uh, and uh, try to state things maybe slightly differently than the way ISA does. Uh, I will be providing some criticisms of the arguments, maybe slightly different than ISA's as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at what I will call argument six. This is the argument from situations. So in your notes, you might write down argument six from situations. Or, I'm sorry, this should be argument five. Forgive me. Argument five from situations. Argument five from situations. Step one. Morality is determined by situations. Step two, situations are relative and changing. Three, this is the conclusion, hence morality is relative and changing. Let's go through that again. One, morality is determined by situations. Two, situations are relative and changing. Three, therefore, morality is relative and changing. Now I'm going to talk about this argument just a little bit and try to give you some reasons for thinking that this is a decent argument. Situations are clearly relevant for morality. So for example, um, suppose you find yourself in the following situation. You are at the beach and someone is drowning in a riptide. Uh, very dangerous situation. Riptides are extremely dangerous, and riptides also have the following characteristic. They often, um, if you go into a riptide, the likelihood of you getting caught up in it and not being able to get out of it is very, very high, especially let's assume that you are not an advanced swimmer or a lifeguard. So in such a situation, do you have an obligation to run out and save the stranger drowning in the riptide? Arguably not. Arguably you do not have such an obligation to run out and, and risk your life uh, in order to save this stranger in the riptide, or even perhaps straight, you know, save your wife or husband or child. Now, it would be wonderful if you did such a thing and you sacrificed your life or, or potentially sacrificed your life to save the stranger or, or whatever. But that doesn't mean you have an obligation. So it might be good to do such a thing, but you might not be obligated. And what that means, or, or one implication of that is this, that uh, if, you, if you fail to go out into the riptide to save the, the person who's drowning, you're not morally criticizable. You're not blameworthy for what you've done. Now, you might be praiseworthy, highly praiseworthy, if you go out and do attempt to save that drowning person, but you're not criticizable. You ought not to feel moral guilt. You might feel a different type of guilt, but you ought not to feel moral guilt for failing to go out there. If you had the obligation to save the person from drowning in the riptide, then you should feel moral guilt, and you would be morally blameworthy, morally criticizable for failing to do so. So the situation and your particular circumstances and set of characteristics are relevant for determining what you ought to do. Now, pretend that you now or someone else is a highly skilled, trained lifeguard. 
and they see someone drowning in the riptide. Now that person, given their skill set, given their job, the obligations that are associated with the job, and the situation that they find themselves in, they, it seems, do have an obligation to save the person drowning in the riptide. So situations are relevant for determining morality, right? They're relevant for determining what we should do, how we should act, the situation. And the situation involves all sorts of different features, right? It involves uh, the, the persons or person uh, uh, to whom or for whom you are acting. It involves your features. It involves environmental factors. It involves temporal factors, times. Uh, you know, it would involve maybe geographical factors, economic factors, all of those things are relevant. All of those things help go into determining what the situation is. And as I just illustrated, the situ situations can be relevant for determining the morality. They are relevant. Now, what Libby is trying to say in this argument, in argument five, or at least what is being suggested, it seems, is that the situation is all there is for determining the morality uh, of the act. And of course, uh, even if this, I mean, here, here's one thing that ISA doesn't bring up. Um, take a look then, so, so step one says morality is determined by situations. I take it, or if the argument's going to be an argument for moral relativism, it really should be something like, <clears throat> morality is completely determined by situations. Now go to step two. It says situations are relative and changing. Here I don't quite understand what step two means, and I don't think ISA spends enough time on probing this. Um, situational ethics was a big, big deal in like the 70s and 80s. Um, it kind of fell off the... Uh, uh, out of popularity, certainly it fell out of popularity amongst professional ethicists, philosophers, and whatnot. Um, and and look, it did sort of what it was. It it, it definitely did one thing. It, it it helped people see that situations are relevant. But situational ethics was attempting to use this idea to somehow demonstrate moral relativism, and nobody really bought it. Part of the reason nobody bought it is because what does it mean that situations are relative and changing? And how is that relevant? <clears throat> so what does it mean for a situation to be, re to be relative? Well, think about the example that I just gave. I'm an observer watching someone drowning in a riptide. I don't have the requisite skills to go save them. I will likely die and drown with them. Given those features of the situation, I have no obligation to save them. You are a well-trained lifeguard. You have a job to save people that are drowning in riptides. You, it seems, have a moral obligation to go save the person drowning in the riptide. So in that sense, uh, one of us has a moral obligation and one of us doesn't, but our situations are different from each other, right? Our situations are different in such a way that the, the, the moral principle save someone who's drowning applies to you and it doesn't really apply to me because the moral principle is more like save someone who is drowning if you are able to, right? Uh, um, save someone who is drowning, you know, uh, there, there's a qualification here. Don't go save someone who is drowning if the likelihood that you are going to drown is extremely high. Or don't go save someone who is drowning if your attempt to do so is going to inhibit, is going to make it more difficult for persons who are better able to intervene in the situation. So things like that, right? My going out to save that person drowning in the riptide now is going to have two people drowning in a riptide and the lifeguard is, is going to be in a much worse position when attempting to save us or save that person. So the fact that the situation, the fact that situations are relative, uh, it's not clear what that means. Relative to what? To the to so situations certainly change because the persons involved in the situations change, the time changes, and so on and so forth. But it's not clear that that makes situations relative. So step two looks odd. 
we would need a deeper analysis of that. And if step two is false, then the conclusion just doesn't follow. All right, let's put that to the side. Uh, let's go to, so, so anyway, so with respect to argument number five from situations, situations do seem relevant, that's clear. Let's look at argument number six. Let's call this the argument from motives or intentions. So the argument from motives or intentions goes like this, step one, Morality is determined by motives. Two, motives are relative to the individual. Three, therefore morality is relative to the individual. So once again, step one, morality is determined by motives. Two, motives are relative to the individual. Three, therefore morality is relative to the individual. Okay, so what this, seems, what this argument seems to be doing is, is getting us the idea, certainly that motives are relevant to morality. But if this argument is going to demonstrate moral relativism, then the argument's going to have to do more than say motives are relevant. It's going to have to say really that motives are the only thing that are relevant, that is relevant to morality. So once again, step one actually should be changed to something like morality is wholly or completely determined by motives. And once again, that looks that look, that's going to be challenged, and uh, we'll cha I'll challenge that um, in just a second. But the idea that morality, that motives are relevant for morality, is pretty much not. Uh, uh, it's it is disputed by some, uh, but it's it seems like it's it's pretty safe. The idea that motives are relevant, that they're relevant for morality. So, for example. Um, uh, suppose uh, we're on a boat. I don't know why I'm using. Maybe I, I, I'm desperate to get back to the beach or something like that. Uh, suppose we're on a boat. You fall overboard, and I go to save you. I throw you a life preserver, um, and I reel you in, or a rope, or maybe I even jump in, and I save you and rescue you. We get back to the boat. Okay, yay, yay, yay. Everyone's clapping. Good job. Uh, for saving that person. Now, suppose, unbeknownst to you and unbeknownst to the others, that my motive for saving you was this. Perhaps my motive for saving you was to receive praise. Maybe there's someone on board that I really wanted to impress. That does seem to diminish the moral praiseworthiness of my action. Um, and so my motive looks relevant to assessing the moral worth of what I've done. The motive seems to be relevant. Now, suppose, or, or, you know, perhaps maybe my motive is this, maybe my motive is even more sinister. Suppose my motive was to save you from drowning because I thought that that was not the kind of death that I wanted you to, to die by. Maybe I have some deep-seated anger and hatred towards you, and I thought drowning is too easy for you. So I'm going to save you from drowning so that I can torture you in the, uh, you know, uh, later on, in the bottom of the boat, uh, later on. So my motive for saving you is so that I can inflict even greater uh, pain and punishment upon you later. So it looks like if that were my motive for saving you, that my act is no longer a morally praiseworthy one, but is in fact a morally pernicious, uh, evil act. So the motive is relevant for determining the morality of what it is that I've done. Now, why not think that the motive is the only thing that matters? Well, one reason, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll perhaps talk about some of this a little bit later, one reason for thinking um, that the motive isn't the only thing that matters or can't be the only thing that matters is because uh, it seems like there are some types of actions, there are some types of action where it doesn't matter what your motive is what you've done, the, that type of action is a morally impermissible type of action. It is never to be performed. It's a type of action that is always morally wicked, morally wrong, 
no matter the motive of the person performing the action. And so that action could never be, what you've done could never be praiseworthy. You're still doing regardless of your motive. So you can think of good examples, I'm sure, but think of rape. Uh, um, you know, suppose, suppose someone says, uh, if you rape this person, um, suppose, suppose someone has a gun trained on 10 different individuals and says, I will kill all these 10 individuals unless you rape the, this person. Suppose you go ahead and do it. Uh, most of us would think, I, myself included, that, uh, what you did was morally, morally heinous. Rape is never permissible. Um, uh, now you might think, oh, that's a tragedy. That's a tragic situation. You were sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't. Maybe that is. But even if that is one of those situations, it's still the, ca the case that you did something terrible. You did something wicked. Now maybe what you did, you know, was to prevent something even more wicked. That doesn't take away from the wickedness of, of rape. Um, uh, nevertheless, I actually think that's probably not the right analysis, but you get the idea. Okay, so genocide. Is genocide ever morally permissible to wipe out an entire people group based upon racial, ethnic, religious uh, identities or characteristics? Is that ever permissible? Uh, no matter the motive. Suppose your motive is a really good one. Maybe, uh, you know, you really believe, you honestly, sincerely believe that uh, taking this this people group out will make the world a better place. And let's say you have some evidence for that claim, right? Uh, suppose you believe that taking this people group out will usher them into heaven more quickly. Uh, so your motive is really one, it looks like, out of, you, you really want to benefit this people group that you want to eliminate, that you want to wipe out and kill, uh, you're, you're, you're doing it for their sake. Well, it looks like, nevertheless, the act of genocide is a, an act that is never morally permissible regardless of the motives. Uh, one thing that I tell students all the time, another example I give students is think about Adolf Hitler. I mean, Adolf Hitler's motives, in one sense, right, if you, if you think about his motives and try to occupy his state of mind, trust me, this is something that, you know, I'm, I'm reluctant to do and reluctant to say, especially around family. I have family that suffered and died in the Holocaust. Um, but, you know, think about Adolf Hitler. His motives, uh, you know, were to make the world a better place. Right in a, in an abstract generalizing sort of sense, his motive was to make the world a, a, a better place. Of course, he wanted to make the world a better place, and he thought getting rid of Jews would do so. Uh, think about Satan's motives. Even if you don't believe in Satan, I don't care. Just think about Satan as a fictional character then, who embodies you know radical radical wickedness and evil. Nevertheless, you know if we were to talk to Satan, Satan's motives for the most part, would be, I want to make the world a better place, right? I, I, I think that God is screwing things up. He's wrong. You know, the, the traditional depiction of the fall of Satan is that Satan's pride got in the way because Satan thought that God was doing something wrong or foolish by paying so much attention to the human race and neglecting the angelic race or angels. And so... Satan re revolted. He rebelled against this because he thought God was making a mistake. So, you know, in, in a sense, his motives, you might think, were, were decent, right? He wanted to correct a mistake. And he, and, and you know, uh, uh, the rest is history. Okay, so motives aren't, can't wholly determine morality, it looks like. Okay, so argument six looks like it fails by itself. Or, or sorry, argument five from situations fails by, it, by itself. Argument six from motives <coughs> fails by itself. Notice also, by the way, that, that Libby, uh, in presenting both of these arguments, she's presenting, they're, they're incompatible in a sense, right? So argument five says situations wholly determine uh, morality. Argument six says motives wholly determine morality. Well, it can't be both. It can't be that situations wholly determine morality and, and motives wholly determine morality. So it looks like, I mean, Libby, Libby's presenting 
both of these arguments, uh, and uh, if one is true, the other, if one is a valid, good, sound argument, then the other can't be. Okay, Isa's response here is really an appeal back to uh, uh, interview number two. So this is why I spent a decent amount of time in the video lecture on interview number two, where we talked about the Jean Valjean and the Nazi case, because that stuff is now relevant here in Isa's lengthy reply. And his reply is that Libby has only given us a portion of sort of uh, the moral landscape. So the situation is part of morality. The motive or intention is part of morality. And then Isa says the act itself is a part of morality, and that's something that Libby has left out of her account. So Isa thinks that all three of these things are involved in the uh, in, in what determines a human action's moral status. Okay, so what makes a human act good or what makes a human act bad or a human act right or a human act wrong are three things, the situation, the motive, and the act itself, those three things. Now, the act itself, that's the part that Libby left off, and that's the part that's really going to relate back to interview number two. The act itself tells us the principle or the law uh, of, the, of the situation. The act, the, the act itself gives us the principle, the law, right, for determining whether or not that type of action is a wrong type of action or if that type of action is a permissible type of action. The other things, the situation, the motive, those give us the application of the principle and the attitude, the internal states that we're supposed to be in when performing the action. Okay, so all of this assumes that some type of actions cannot come from good motives, right? So there's types of actions that it doesn't matter the motives. We just talked about that at length. So the, so the idea again is there's no right attitude I can have when if, if uh, or let's use somebody else so it's not me performing these sick, sickening acts. There's no right attitude that, you know, Frank can have when molesting children. So can't Frank can't get off the hook for doing something wrong by saying, I was doing it because those kids were going to feel good. Um, Right, maybe Frank can give an insanity plea or something like that, but that's not going to, to make the act of child molesting good. The act of child molesting is one of those actions that are that that uh, uh, are necessarily bad actions, no matter the situation, no matter the motivation or the intention in performing them. Rape, genocide, uh, maybe torture is a part of that. Um, and so on and so forth. So those are action types, types of actions that can never be performed, right? So the motive do, is irrelevant for changing that type of action from a bad one to a good one. Can't do it. It's always an impermissible kind of action. Okay, so but that type of action, we need to know whether or not that type of action is the one being performed and the situation can give us some of the clues to knowing what type of action was performed. The motive can also be relevant for helping us determine what type of action is performed, but it's not always relevant. Um, so, so we want to know, so take for example my first, my, the, the, the first case that I gave you about watching somebody drowning in a riptide, um, and I don't do anything. I'm watching them drown, and it and and you're you, you're dumbfounded. Suppose you're in a hotel watching this, and you see this person drowning in the riptide. You see me standing on the beach, you know, yelling at them, waving for them, but I'm not going in. You can't believe, and you think that I've done something morally heinous. Well, now let's say you discover something about the situation would change the type of action you thought you saw. So you thought you saw the type of action of gross negligence, right? Or a kind of indirect manslaughter or something like that, right? Um, 
where my inaction is morally blameworthy. Now let's say you discover that I can't swim. That changes, that new feature of the situation changes the type of act. You thought you saw a type of act of willful negligence, right? Or, or a kind of indirect homicide or something like that. That's what you thought the type of action was. It turns out that wasn't the type of action because you didn't have all the information about the situation. So you need, so the act type will help us figure out what the moral, whether I performed an action, a good action or a bad action, and determining the act type, uh, uh, the situation is relevant for determining the act type. The motive might be relevant in some cases for determining the act type. But ISO wants to, wants to really, really highlight the act type. So go back to the Jean Valjean case. What type of action was performed? We all agree that at a general level, the type of action that was performed was a taking. Now we want to know, was it a taking that is a stealing, or was it a taking that was, a, that was not a stealing? It was definitely a taking. Was it a taking that is a stealing, or was it a taking that is not a stealing? And so the situation can help us determine that. So we look at Jean Valjean's situation. He's literally starving to death. His family is literally starving to death. I'm not saying starving to death in a metaphorical or exaggerated hyperbolic way. They're, 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 they're starving to death. The person who takes the bread from, bread is rotting in their pantry. Food is rotting in their pantry because they have so much of it. <coughs> and people are starving to death literally right outside their door. That's, again, not an exaggeration or hyperbolic. These are people that are not thousands of miles away, so that getting them the food and the funds and whatnot might prove to be difficult. No, they're right outside the door, and this person is just callous and, and, and uh, doesn't care. So in that case, ISA argues that it's a taking that is not a stealing. Now, you may disagree with the analysis, but the point is that... The situation helps us figure out what the action type is, and then once we know what the action type is, we can figure out what the morality, uh, whether the act, whether the act is a good act or a bad act, a right act or a wrong act. So if it's a stealing, then it's going to be a wrong act for the moral abs according to the moral absolutist. If it's a lying, it's going to be a morally wrong act for the moral absolutist. If it's a murder. Right, so there are killings that are murders, there are killings that are non-murders, the situation and other things can help us figure out what that action type is. So I hope that makes sense to you. I hope you see the connection between interview number two. Um, another point here, and then, and then we'll move on and spend a little less time on the, the remaining arguments, but another super important point here, Isa brings up the principle, the idea, judge not lest ye be judged. So this is one of the most quoted portions of the Bible. Uh, it's one of, I think, the most misunderstood portions of the Bible. Isa makes a nice case, makes a nice point here. Uh, I'll repeat his point and then add a little bit to it. So Isa says that this is actually about the heart, not the act. So I think that's that's an important distinction to make, right? So when when the principle says judge not, yes, leave ye be judged, Isa says what's going on here is it's saying you can't judge hearts, you can't because you can't know hearts, but you can judge actions, you can judge behaviors, right? So you you are allowed to say so. Imagine, uh, you know, Frank. Uh, is is caught with child pornography or molesting children or selling people into sex slavery or whatever, right? So, that, so this is what Frank gets busted for. And then Frank says to to people who are who are furious with him, he says, "Judge not, lest ye be judged." Well, the idea here, right, is is uh, that's absurd. right? So we can say that what Frank was doing was morally wicked and awful. What we can't say, what we ought not to do then, is to say that Frank himself is thereby somehow less valuable than you or me. Uh, what Frank has done, the action he has performed, is terrible and heinous. 
But it could be the case that Frank, you know, so think of a fanciful scenario. Maybe there's a parasite in Frank's brain. There's a tumor in Frank's brain that has inhibited him from being able to make decisions properly. I don't know that's the case, but suppose that's the case. If that's the case, then the action that he's performed is still a wicked, terrible, morally awful action, but maybe Frank's blameworthiness, maybe his contribution to the action isn't as bad as we thought. Um, uh, you might think this about racists. Suppose someone who is born in a racist community from from birth until adulthood. I mean, they're just surrounded by nothing but racism. That's all they hear. So they view other races through the lens of this. That's how they've been educated. That's how they've been taught, so on and so forth. Most of us would say that that person's view of the world is false. It's a terrible view of the world. It's a false view of the world to think these other races are less valuable than yours. It's a wicked view of the world to think these other races are less valuable than yours. It's false, it's wicked, it's wrong, blah, blah, blah. But we might think that that person is somehow less blameworthy maybe than the persons who taught him or who raised him. It's going to be difficult for him to, to have escaped those views. Uh, now, we might still think that there's some blame when he became an adult. He, he could have thought harder about it. He could have done a little bit of research and seen that the research doesn't support the idea that these other races are less valuable, that the propaganda that he's been fed his whole life is a bunch of garbage. He, he could have and should have done that research when he reached adulthood. But what about when he's 13? What about when he's 14, right? We might be less critical of his heart given the circumstances and whatnot. And nevertheless, the attitudes, the actions that are performed on the basis of racism are still morally wrong. So the idea is you judge the sin, not the sinner. Um, so that's part of the judge not lest you be judged, and I think that's an, important, uh, that's an important move to make. Another important move to make is this, and this is, this is of course related, that the judge not lest you be judged, uh, there's two different types of judgment. Right, so there's the type of judgment that is involved in discernment, and this is a good kind of judging. Discerning between, you make these kinds of judgments all the time. You discern between actions you want to perform and actions you don't. Maybe some of you have been tempted to cheat in this class. I hope you haven't. But you discerned between cheating and non-cheating, and you decided, Lord willing, not to do so. Maybe you've been tempted to lie in the past, right? You distinguish between lying and not lying. So discerning, right? We discern between all sorts of stuff. Maybe, uh, you know, you've had an opportunity to do some hardcore drugs in the past and you've decided, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to hang out with people who are constantly snorting coke or injecting heroin or something like that. And so you're discerning between different types of actions, different types of persons, different types of situations, um, and doing so is, is necessary for you to live a good, flourishing, meaningful life. You have to make those types of discern those distinctions. Uh, that's a kind of discernment. So that type of judging is not only not wrong, it's required for living a, a, a good, full life. There's a different type of judging. So the word judging is sort of ambiguous. It can mean discerning. Or it can mean condemning. And so the condemning type of judging is the one that, that most people probably associate with this passage. And that is where you condemn not the action, but again, the actor. You condemn the agent, right? So you think the agent, you think less of the agent. You put yourself above the actor, right? You make yourself to be better than them. And that is precisely what Christ is warning about because he goes on to say... Judge not lest ye be judged, because by the very standard that you judge someone, you will be judged by that standard. And so there's a kind of hypocrisy that is being warned about here. That when I condemn you by and then make myself more valuable, better than you as a human, as a person, right? what I'm doing is I'm actually engaging in a kind of distinction between you and me in terms of our internal or intrinsic value. That is precisely the, the thing that I'm railing against. So I'm criticizing you, and then in doing so, 
making myself to be better than you, so you are thereby worse than me, right? You are less valuable than me. And the very thing I'm criticizing you for doing is going to be, in a sense, that very thing. That you were did something that demeaned others, that made them less than you. And so by condemning you, I actually am doing the very thing that I am condemning. I'm making myself better than you. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, shoot me an email. Okay, let's move on. Argument. This is argument seven. We'll call this the argument from projection. The argument from projection goes like this. Step one, we don't sense values, only facts. Step one, we don't sense values, only facts. Step two, if we don't sense something, let's call it X. If we don't sense X and we still claim that X exists, then X must be something internal to us and not a feature of external reality. Step two, if we don't sense something, X, and we still claim that X exists, then X must be something internal to us and not a feature of external reality. Three, therefore, values are internal to us and not a feature of external reality. Therefore, values are internal to us and not a feature of external reality. Okay, let's go through this. Step one, the idea that we don't sense values, only facts, has some legs to it. It's got some plausibility. The idea is this. You don't see, taste, hear, uh, touch, smell, goodness, rightness, wrongness, badness. Uh, you don't really sort of visually observe courage or honesty justice, generosity, kindness, loyalty. Uh, those are all sort of good features of things. You don't literally see. A famous example of this is suppose you're, you know, you're walking around downtown Huntington or wherever you live and you turn the corner and you see a group of kids and uh, one kid is holding a cat, another kid has some gasoline that he's pouring on the cat, and another kid has a match that he's about ready to strike. What do you see? What do you observe? Well, you observe all those things that I just mentioned. I mean, technically speaking, you actually, you know, you really observe various shapes and colors. But uh, uh, so you so you observe all those things that I mentioned. But do you observe? Did you see callousness, maliciousness, uh, evil? Uh, did you observe, see, cowardice? You didn't actually see those things. And so the idea of this argument, this is a very sort of famous argument for a kind of moral relativism. The idea here is that what you observe is a world of facts and then you paint the world with value. You add value on to this world of facts in the same way that many people who've taken a little bit of physics think of color. So many people think that color, it doesn't exist outside of, a, of us or, you know, visual observers, that the world is fundamentally colorless and that when you add visual uh, observers to the world, color gets added on. But color doesn't exist in the world by itself. You have to add people with eyes and so on and so forth. You don't get color. So the world is fundamentally colorless, and we paint the world red, white, blue, so on and so forth. The idea is, analogously, that the world is fundamentally valueless. It's just a world of, you know, uh, atoms, subatomic particles, things like that, bumping into each other or combining with one another to form various medium-sized objects. It's a, it's a fact world without value, and then we come and we paint the world with value. We add on. So the values aren't out there in the world. And one of the crucial steps in this argument is based on observation, right? So the idea is that if it's not sensed by us, then it doesn't exist. If we can't sense it, if it, if it can't be observed, then it doesn't exist. Uh, and we're adding it on to the world. Okay, so hopefully the argument, this is where I'm calling it, we're calling this the argument from projection. It's also sometimes called the argument from emotion or emo emotivism. Um, okay, 
So ISA responds with a bunch of different things. I'll go through this quickly and then maybe add a little bit of my own. The idea is this. ISA says that this is confused. He says the feeling that I have inside of me when I see those kids pouring the gasoline on the cat is not the moral quality or the moral feature. Instead, the feeling is responding to something there, right? So, so the idea is this, and this is a fascinating thought. Maybe, maybe it's a thought that many of you haven't had, that feelings can be right or wrong. So suppose you round the corner, you see the kids pouring the gasoline on the cat, kid about ready to light it, and you smile and get excited. If you're like me, uh, I'm not a fan of cats. Uh, I think cats probably only exist after the fall. Um, they're like a new species that came into existence after the fall of human beings. Um, just kidding, sort of. Uh, so, so, uh, suppose I round the corner and I smile, right? I get sort of excited about what I'm seeing. Ooh, that's a feeling that I ought not to have. That feeling is criticizable. I shouldn't have the feeling. You might say that feeling doesn't match the situation. My feeling is out of touch. It's out of kilter. It's out of whack. It doesn't fit the situation that I'm observing. Now, suppose you round the corner and you see this and you become uh, angry, you become fearful, you become upset, you you know jump into action and you go and try to save the cat. That Those feelings, we might say, fit the situation properly. And so Isa's point here is the feeling that you have is about a feature of the situation. The feeling itself is not a feature of the situation. That's absurd. The situation is over there. The situation is the kids with the cat. I see it, and I have a feeling about that. I don't have a feeling about something inside of me. The feeling is about something over there. And so to say that, that uh, the value is internal to me is to, is to confuse the feeling with the value. Okay. That's, part, that's one of his replies. Another reply is that empiricism, or we might call this radical empiricism, is being assumed and empiricism is false. Okay, so empiricism is the idea that all knowledge, um, that all claims have to be grounded in sensory experience. Right, so everything has to be, you can't know it. Maybe another way of putting this is... Um, if it can't be sensed, it can't be known. Okay. So I used to give some examples here, right? Your own consciousness. You don't sense your own consciousness. Instead, your consciousness is the foundation of sensory experience. Uh, so, so your own agency, right? You, the being that experiences the taste of water. You, the being that experiences the hearing of my voice. You, the being that experiences the seeing of me unshaven. Right? You, that being, you're, you are, there's, there's, a, there's a being that, is, that has those senses, that, it, that has those experiences, but the, the, the consciousness, the self that is the bearer, the experiencer, is not itself experienced. It's not itself sensed by taste, touch, sound, smell, so on and so forth. And so the idea then that ICE is getting at is uh, if, if in order for something to exist, it has to be sensed or, or it doesn't exist if it's not sensed, then it would follow that your own consciousness doesn't exist. And that's absurd. Um, uh, lots of other things. I mean, you know, science would be undermined here. ISA really doesn't go into this, but science would actually be undermined. There's lots of claims in science. There's lots of ideas in science that cannot be observed. So, for example, the first uh, moments of the existence of the universe literally cannot be observed by us. We can indirectly sort of infer things. We couldn't have existed even during those first moments of the universe. Um, electrons, subatomic particles... Not only do, do we not have no direct observation of them, we can't have direct observation of them. They're on a scale that is impossible for us to observe. Numbers, uh, geometrical figures, things like that. Perfect geometrical figures. No one's ever observed a, tri a perfect triangle, right? Uh, it's a mathematical construct. It's a mathematical object, right? Uh, those 
and science is based on math, right? Get rid of math, you get rid of science. Mathematical entities, truths cannot be sensed. Um, so this would then rule those out, which would also undermine and rule out science. The main problem also is that the claim is self-referentially absurd. So the idea that all of our knowledge or uh, uh, in, order for, in order for us to know that something exists, it has to be sensed, you might say, well, how do you know that? Have you sensed that claim that in order for something to exist, it has to be sensed? Have you sensed that claim? Or we might put it like this. This is sometimes called scientism. Scientism is the belief that science, um, the scientific method uh, alone uh, gets us knowledge, right? So the only way to acquire knowledge is the scientific method. Um, so, so the idea would be, look, if you can't prove something via the scientific method, then it can't be proved or it can't be known. But then you can ask of that very claim, right? Is that claim, have you proven the claim that if it cannot be proved via the scientific method, then it cannot be known. Have you proven that via the scientific method? Well, no, that, that claim can't be proved via the scientific method. How could it be? Think about it for a minute. The claim that if it can't be proved via the scientific method, then it can't be proved or it can't be known. You can't apply the scientific method to that claim. To do so would be circular, but worse, it just can't be done, right? It's not a claim that is susceptible to the scientific method. So then that claim can't be known. It refutes itself. It defeats itself. So Isa says that this argument from projection is assuming that type of empiricism, and that type of empiricism is just clearly false. Lastly, the argument from evolution, I'm going to be very quick here. Step one, evolution explains the origin of morality. Step two, so morality is simply about doing what is necessary to survive. Three, but doing what is necessary to survive is relative. Four, hence morality is relative. Okay, this is not quite the way this is presented in the text. I think my presentation here is more clear. If you disagree, I'd love to hear from you, and maybe you could represent the argument in a better way. I'm definitely open to being wrong about my presentation being clearer than what's in the text. I'll go through it again. Step one, this is the argument from evolution. Evolution explains the origin of morality. Two, so morality is simply about doing what is necessary to survive. Three, but doing what is necessary to survive is relative. Four, hence morality is relative. Um, okay, so Isa's main reply is this, that it violates the principle that you can't get something from nothing. You're trying to get morality from non-morality or consciousness from non-consciousness. He also says that it's trying to get an ought from an is. Um, I actually don't like these replies from Isa. The first one's better than the second one, right? That it violates the principle of trying to get something from nothing. The second one of trying to get an ought from an is, um, I, don't, I don't care for that. The reason I don't care for that is because I'm inclined to think you can get oughts from is. So for example, my heart ought to pump blood through my body. That's a fact of my heart, and I got that from what my heart is, right? What my heart is determines how it's supposed to function, and how it's supposed to function tells me what it ought to be doing. My eyes ought to see certain things, ought to, ought to be able to take in light and so on. And so an eye that can't take in light is a defective eye. So from what my eye is, I learned the function of the eye, and that can tell me what it ought to be doing, how it ought to be behaving and performing. So I actually disagree the, a problem with this argument is that it tries to get an ought from an is. I think this is a bad criticism that Isa is raising. Nevertheless, this argument, the, the argument, there's some better responses. Um, one response is uh, that the argument actually assumes moral absolutism, right? Because it assumes that we should do whatever's necessary to survive, right? That that's what we should be doing. We should be doing what's necessary to survive. Uh, and so if that's the case, that's moral absolutism, because that would apply to every single person, every single human being. Uh, so moral absolutism, the, the, the moral sort of law or rule would be do what's necessary to survive. You ought to do what's necessary to survive. Um, the other thing is, uh, Isa gives this response too, I think, that it contradicts experience. 
Um, and so the idea here is we don't experience morality in the same way that we experience our own sort of biological, physiological instincts. All right, so I have an instinct to, to hit someone because they looked at me wrong or they cut me off or something like that, and yet I resist doing so. I have an instinct to eat, 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 and yet I don't do so because I'm worried about uh, not just health, but I'm also worried about that that makes me into a kind of person that is, you know, uh, uh, focused on a certain type of, of uh, pleasure, gustatory pleasure or something like that, right? Um, and so the idea is that if this argument, if this were correct, then no, no action that we performed that wasn't uh, somehow connected to evolution would make sense. And yet this is not the way we see things, right? So this argument actually doesn't take in all the, all the data. It's not the way we experience the world, right? In fact, we look at persons who only perform actions that are evolutionary enhancing, spreading their genes, so to speak, we look at them and think there's something morally pernicious. There's something, there's something problematic. They're behaving too animalistically, too beastly, um, right? And so uh, uh, this this argument doesn't take into account our own internal experience. Doesn't take into account the way we treat one another. And so it doesn't take into account all of the data. Furthermore, this argument would actually. If this were correct, then there all all sorts of actions would would turn out that we typically think are morally wicked would turn out to be morally permissible. So, for example, if spreading genes is all there is, then it's hard to see why rape is wrong. It would be hard to see why artificially inseminating uh, uh, women uh, in comas uh, would be wrong. Um, if spreading genes, right, if that's, if, and it looks like, I mean, that's all evolution really is about, right? I mean, evolution is um, about genetic diversity and spreading our own uh, uh, genes throughout the population, right? So it's going to be tricky to rule out certain types of behavior that most of us think are clearly morally wrong. That's it for today.